Hi, I'm Agnes. And I'm Natalie. We're friends and co-workers. And this is our podcast, Dinner Last Night. Nat and I share a passion for food and events. And over 35 years of combined experience in the hospitality industry. So pour yourself a glass of wine. Or whiskey. And join us while we share our adventures in home cooking, entertaining. And of course, what we made for dinner last night. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Dinner Last Night. I'm here with my co-host, Agnes. Agnes, what did you make for dinner last night? Hi, everyone. Um, actually, the past couple of days, um, we were away. It was Owen's ninth birthday. So we went to the Poconos and uh, spent the weekend uh, at Camelback Resort. Um, it has this great... I guess, uh, water park, indoor water park that, um, you know, we've been going there for years and, uh, we went for dinner on his birthday to this place, uh, up there called Barclay Creek Brewery. And this place does very amazing things. They do wood fire pizza. They do a uh, house made barbecue, but really the reason why we started going there is because they completely go overboard with their Halloween decoration. <laughs> they do, it's such a huge production. It's very creepy. It's very spooky and it's everywhere. Like some tables are dedicated to skeleton and the setup it was just, it, it's incredible. And every year they do such a wonderful job. So we, we go there. Owen really loves just is obsessed with Halloween. I think it's going away a little bit now, but he's always loved Halloween as a child. Mm -hmm. So um, we make it a point to go there on his birthday. Um, but I did make a couple of very interesting things this week. So the first thing that I've made is, uh, I don't know if you remember, but I told you that on Wednesdays, I like to make breakfast for dinner, right? Mm -hmm. So I made baked eggs and... That recipe was pretty incredible. Um, you take some gratin, like baking dish, mm -hmm. and you put a um, you put a tablespoon of uh, whipping cream and a, a little bit of butter, and you put it in the broiler for maybe I don't know, like a minute until it bubbles up, and then you put three eggs into you know take it out of the oven, put three eggs in, and then put a mix of like fresh parsley. Um, fresh parsley, rosemary, fresh thyme, all chopped up, and a tablespoon of uh, Parmesan cheese, and you sprinkle it all over it, and then put it back in the oven for maybe uh, six minutes until it's the until the whites settle, but the yolk still, um, you know, is still kind of wobbly. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm making the movement so that you can translate for me. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, and that was really, really like easy. Like this is like a seven minute dinner and it was just very, very tasty. I took a recipe. I took the recipe from uh, Barefoot in Paris from Ina Garten. Mm -hmm. And it's all like kind of like a French recipes. And I know we're talking about cookbooks a little bit later on. So mm -hmm. that was uh, that was a great one. And and that night, since this was so easy, I also made, um, since last week we went apple picking, I also made an apple crisp. And um, I took the recipe from New York Time Cooking. Mm -hmm. And it's an apple crisp that you make into a cast iron pan. And um, I always like when we do an apple crisp with maybe orange zest or lemon zest or something like that. Well, that recipe calls for cardamom. Mm -hmm. And I don't really use cardamom a lot. The first time I bought cardamom, I think, was last year when I made mulled wine. Mm -hmm. um, so not I'm not really used to cooking with it, but uh, it calls for cardamom, and it was just very, very delicious. It's one of those spices that then you eat it, and you're like, what is this? Like, mm -hmm. there's something other than apples and cinnamon, but I don't know what it is. So that was excellent. The downside to this is that I had a little bit of leftover and left it in the cast iron pan in the fridge for a couple of oh, days. No. And then when I took it back, the cast iron pan like blackened my my apple crisp. <laughs> Why did it happen? <laughs> I'm just not good with taking care of my cast iron pans, but like um. it, it was, you know, I guess you don't you can't leave water. There was maybe too much water in the dish and then it mm -hmm. kind of like oxidized and yeah. Yeah. 
didn't do too much out of it. Oh, and also on that recipe, it makes you do a, a caramel sauce ahead of time. Mm-hmm. And that's just, that was just incredible. I Very know, good. you sent me pictures. It looked delicious. I know, I can't wait to share with everyone. Yeah. yeah. What did you make to dinner last night? Um, so... This week, you know, I've been like very uninspired this week and also just very lazy. I don't know why. I don't know if it's like the season changing, but like I really like usually, you know, on Sundays or Mondays, I like look forward to like planning all the wheels, uh, the meals for the week. But last weekend, I don't know. I like I like put it off and put it off. And I was like, okay, I really need to figure out what we're going to eat. So I know like what groceries to buy. And, you know, I kind of just like went with like really basic things that I just knew like were not going to be a hassle for me, you know, when I got home from work. So the most recent thing I made was like a a fish curry. I used like it was like a Thai, like red curry. Um, But it's I kind of was like riffing off this this dish that is sort of like a Cantonese comfort food, I guess. That's like a fish curry, but it's the, like a yellow curry. That's like a much sweeter, right. And thicker usually than like Thai curries. Um, and, uh, and I remember eating it all the time when I was a kid from this one, um, little place near our house. And you know, what it is, is like the, it's fried fish fillets and then Mm -hmm. the curry is, is poured over the top, right. Usually with potatoes and carrots or whatever over rice. Um, uh, so I have like, you know, all these different curry paste in my fridge. So I figured, you know, I'll do like a red curry. We'll go like a little Thai. And, um, but I just didn't feel like getting fish and then like battering it and everything myself. So, you know, what I did is I took, I always have some like frozen battered fish fillets because as a kid, I always loved fish sticks. And so yes. even now, like every once in a while, if I'm feeling really lazy, I'll just make a really quick like fish and chips with it. Um, so I took those, just popped them in the oven, and then just made a really quick like curry sauce with like red um, red curry paste, coconut milk. I threw some lemongrass and like kaffir lime um, in there and then just poured it over my fish fillets uh, over rice. And then uh, stir fried some bok choy. I always have bok choy in the fridge. That's like kind of my go-to green vegetable. Um, So yeah, that's what I had most recently. But otherwise, yeah, the whole week I just I just wasn't feeling it. Although I did make um, Zach's absolute favorite thing uh, is uh, potato gratin. (laughs) Oh yeah. So I so one night we had. steak and potato gratin and you know it's funny because I don't I haven't always had like a lot of success making potato gratin Mm -hmm. and Zach because he loves it so much is so so discerning about it um and Zach's stepmom is Swiss and so she makes an amazing potato gratin so in his head this is like the pinnacle of potato gratin (laughs) so I don't (laughs) you know so whenever I've made it in the past and I you know like I'll agree it's not always been the best it's just something I'm not usually made so you know it's something I think it's definitely one of those things you you have to practice it right and then with time you get kind of used to to everything to like how to cut the potatoes all that but this time was probably my best attempt Zach was quite satisfied we finished the whole thing um so yeah, we had that and steak and um and I actually used the leftover butternut squash. Remember last week I was talking about the stuffed butternut squash that I made. Right. So when you make that recipe, you actually cut off like the long uh top part of the squash. Mm-hmm. So I still had those um those pieces and I did like a butternut squash mash. Um from this recipe from a cookbook that actually somebody recently gifted me. It's called like Malibu Farm. Mhm. It's all these very California um, uh, recipes, but there was one for uh, like a butternut squash mash with like this very, very limey vinaigrette. Um, And well, you wouldn't appreciate the cilantro, but like also also some cilantro. And that turned out really nice. So I actually ate more of that than the gratin. I left the gratin for Zach. But yeah, potato gratin, though, is one of those things. It's really like a labor of love, too, you know. So Zachary, if you're listening... (laughs) <laughs> no, <laughs> the, the gratin is very time consuming and very exacting. Yeah, I tried many, many recipe until finally I found the one. And 
you have to buy the right potatoes. Like mm -hmm. if you buy the wrong potatoes that doesn't absorb any of the liquid, then forget it. Mm -hmm. You have to put it in the oven for the right amount of time. And then the recipe that I have uses, um, you caramelize a lot of onions and also fennel ahead mm. of time. And I feel like the fennel does something delicious mm -hmm. to the dish. But uh, I know over the holidays, a lot of times that we have to bring, you know, a side dish right. or something, something I'll always bring my potato gratin. It's mm -hmm. just phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. But it took, it took years Yeah, because I've, I've, I've tried like, I had tried other recipes and depending on, you know, what would happen a lot of time is the cream would break. Break. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, you, you don't recover from that. No, you can't fix it. Yeah. You put yeah. the top and then mm -hmm. like the potatoes are raw under. Right. Yeah. Sometimes it's like too watery. Yeah. And other times it's too dry. Right. Yeah. And then you got to have like the right cheese. Right. But, yeah. It's a tough, it's a tough one. And then you I can't know. put too much cheese because same thing, certain cheeses won't handle mm -hmm. the temperature in the oven for that long. So mm -hmm. then, yeah, yep. there's some recipe where you par cook. And I can't remember if that the recipe that I use does or doesn't. I think in, in May, you par cook your potatoes in milk mm -hmm. or in cream ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And I think that also like help. It yeah. is a labor of love. Yeah, I think, well, it's funny because it's one of those things that it's really very simple, right? If you were just to read a recipe for potato gratin, it, would, it seems like this very simple thing, but it's a, like a really not forgiving, dish, <laughs> right? Like if, if you mess up like one of the simple things, it's over. You're just having weird, soggy or some soggy, some uncooked potatoes. <laughs> it's the worst. Yeah. It really is a tough one. Yep. Yeah. But this time it turned out well, but yeah. So our theme today is cookbooks. We've already mentioned a couple. Yeah. But our theme today is cookbooks. Um, so we wanted to kind of discuss with everyone our favorite cookbooks, um, you know, the ones that we really cook from, the ones that are more, you know, visually appealing. So where do you want to start, Agnes? Shall we start with maybe the cookbooks that we cook from the most? I think that's a good, um, I think that's a, go a good way to go about it. So... I'm going to start. I don't know if you remember, but uh, back, I think it was in 2013, we went to the Culinary Institute of America, mm -hmm. to the CIA, and we worked a client symposium for the company we worked for at the time. And from that, um, so went to the CIA and we, uh, I purchased this, the CIA of uh, CIA cookbook. Oh. Right there. you can see it yeah yeah mm -hmm. and that is a really good recipe for you know like i just want to make waffle or right. you know like basic stuff one thing mm -hmm. you know is i cannot make anything if i don't have a recipe like i'm a recipe person like i need mm -hmm. i need a recipe now if i don't have something i'll switch it i'll read through it i can by reading a recipe i know if i think i can do it if it's going mm -hmm. to work or not but that's a good you know, that's a good book that I think um, has a lot of staples, right? Yeah. Like pancake, you want a recipe for pancake or you want a right. recipe for scones or you want mm -hmm. a recipe for like all those like basic stuff. That's yes. uh, a good book that I use for. Is it, is it a big one? It looks like quite a tome. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, it's, pretty, it's a pretty big. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it has, um, hold on. It has maybe like 300 and... Over 300 pages. Yeah. And um, it has a little bit of, it has some of the recipes have pictures. They also mm. like focus on like special techniques. So I think it's a good, as I said, it's a good book for like staples. Another yeah. book that I use for a lot for more weekend. And I think I've probably made, and I've mentioned it earlier, but the mm. Barefoot in Paris cookbook from Ina Garten. I think oh, I've made yeah. all of the recipes from that book. Oh, wow. I think I've made like all of them. So inside it has like cauliflower gratin, which is pretty much like your mac and cheese recipe, but with like cauliflower in it. It has your recipe for like ratatouille or for um, mm. uh, chouquette or those like uh, baked eggs. Just like so many like staples, right? Because the problem is if I buy French cookbooks to make French dishes, then it's so hard, right? Like just like switching over the 
the metric and like the the measurement oh, yeah. it's mm-hmm. such a headache but that and you know what i really like about i think i, might, I mentioned Ina garten's book a lot of recipes a lot is because all of her recipes works right you know like it, it just like really work they've been it looks like people have tested them and um you know i don't really watch her show or anything but i just think that her her recipes always work so that's that's a good like mm. every like you know weekend book yeah, yeah. And, and as i said i think i've made i probably made 80 percent of the recipes on that book yeah. and i love them all yeah that's cr- I don't think that I have ever made every recipe in any cookbook that I own. And I own like many, many cookbooks. Maybe that's why. Um, I think I'm also, I think I approach them a little bit differently to you though. I think I, I kind of view cookbooks in particular as like a uh, very like inspirational kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So for me in a cookbook, the, the photos are really important, right? Mm-hmm. That's really like what draws my eye. I think I, I especially eat like with my eyes first and then, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, a lot of, uh, no, that's not to say I don't follow recipes and certainly right with like potato gratin, <laughs> <laughs> I follow the recipe. Um, but a lot of times I, you know, once I've become like accustomed to something, right. I'll try and like get off of it. It's almost like, um, it's almost like if you were a musician learning a piece of music, right? At, at some point you try and like work your way off of it. So I think for me, a lot of the cookbooks that I use, the cookbook that I probably cook, actually cook the recipes from the most is, it's kind of a funny one because she's not a chef, but it's all of Chrissy Teigen's, all of those cravings ones, which, you know, at first I wanted to get just because they seemed kind of cool, kind of novel, mm-hmm. right? And then I started to cook from them and I was like, you know, you know what I love about them is they're so approachable. And I think it's because right. she, she's not a chef, right? Right. But but also the things that she cooks kind of speak to me a little bit because she very often kind of infuses, right? She's part Thai. So she infuses lots of like Asian flavors and Asian ingredients into, you know, very like American dishes or Western dishes. Um, and so it feels like very familiar to me too, the kind of things that she has. Um, but also they're just these very, nothing in there is too crazy. Right. There's, there's really no ingredients that are, you know, really obscure or like, I've never seen this before. I don't even know where to get it or what it looks like. And so it's just so approachable and the recipes are really, really good. They really like stand up to like being hooked multiple times. Yeah. And they're just very kind of like, it's really like good home cooked, uh, like home cooked recipes. Right. Um, they're not made to be these beautiful dishes or anything like that. But yeah, that, strangely, when I was thinking about it earlier today, I was like, you know, I don't know. Let me go see which ones do I actually physically use the most often. Um, yeah. And it's Chrissy Teigen's. I don't know. I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, I have. Uh, I actually have the book, uh, the first one, Cravings. Mm-hmm. And I've made the um, the spring rolls. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the book and it was just so easy so like approachable I think the whole book is just like beautiful the pictures are funny Mm -hmm. you know yeah yeah um and yeah I really like it it's a good book yeah that's the one I cook from the most and then I have a lot of Chinese cookbooks I mean Chinese food and Cantonese food in particular right I obviously like connect with because that's actually what I probably ate the most of growing up um so, but I never really like learned, like I know those flavors really well, right? But I never really learned how to cook those things. But in the last few years, I've started kind of becoming more interested, right, in, you know, how to get those flavors and um, and how to recreate sort of the, those, those tastes, right, from like my childhood. Um, so I have a couple of those. I have I have a couple by um, this uh, woman named Fuchsia Dunlop, who's who's British, but uh, she's very, very well regarded as this kind of master of Chinese cuisine. And she has these very beautifully, beautifully written, beautifully collected um, cookbooks of all these different uh, regional cuisines of China. So I have a couple of those. And there's one that I cook from the most, and it's called uh, Land of Fish and Rice. And that one focuses on like the cuisine of the Jiangnan province, which Mm -hmm. I think that province, the most well-known city is Shanghai. And that 
that cuisine is kind of lesser known of the major ones in China, right? Most people know Cantonese food or they know like Sichuan food. Um, right. And sort of that whole middle part of China is kind of a mystery to most people. But that Jiangnan food is so... Um, I, I spent a lot of time in Shanghai, actually, especially in high school. Um, and uh, the cuisine there, it's it's really like it's a very subtle um, cuisine, but it still uses all of the very th like strong flavors of like Cantonese food. Right. There's still a lot of garlic, a lot of ginger, um, but the cooking methods and and uh, sort of the amount of ingredients and everything, it's it feels like very simplified, but it's a very, very subtle. Lots of things that are kind of slow braised or slow cooked and I just find that those recipes really focus on trying to bring out kind of the best in like one ingredient so one recipe that I made from that I make it pretty often that I love uses bok choy um, mm -hmm. right, which I always have but it's this bok choy that's braised for a long time on like a very slow heat with like soy and hoisin and a uh, dried shiitake mushroom and once that like simmers down, right, you get the super savory flavors of the mushroom, right, as it like rehydrates into that. And then the bok choy just becomes so, so, so like silky and smooth, right? You take it to like p almost like past overcooked, right? Like because overcooked vegetables suck, but like really cooked down to where like you want it to be like falling apart, like melting in your mouth, right? Um and it, it has very, very few ingredients and it's this very simple method, but you just really have to like take your time and be very like measured um, in it. And it's just so good. Like you would never think that bok choy could kind of taste like that and be so um, sort of full of like these like compl complicated flavors, right? That are kind of layered in as it cooks for a long time. So yeah. So I would say I cook from those the most probably. Now, do you feel that this particular book, like my, uh, for instance, as I was saying, my family has, um, my younger brother had offered me this great book called La Cuisine Provençale from a, um, it's called Ma Tourteron. And I think it's mm -hmm. like, see, I'm showing you right now. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and see, it's like, a, it's so beautiful. It's one of those, like you said, that the pictures are so you know, it's like the whole decor mm -hmm. and it's, mm -hmm. it's just like a really beautiful book. And I'm, I'm, I make people who offer me book, I make them like sign them. So see, mm -hmm. he bought it for me for my 20th first, 28th birthday, I see. Okay. Um, so I, I, I keep them and everything, but I also know that some of those recipes, if you don't have like the beautiful goat cheese from this particular area of Provence, like your recipe is not going to taste that good. Right. right. So like mm -hmm. the book that you mentioned, do you feel mm -hmm. like, um, do you feel like you would have a hard time making the recipe as good as it can be? Because some of the ingredients are so specific mm -hmm. to the region that it wouldn't do, you know, it wouldn't do the recipe justice. Yeah. I mean, so the book is well written in that, I mean, earlier you were talking about switching from the metric to imperial, mm -hmm. which I honestly never even thought about. But the, uh, her books are particularly well written because she she lists both, right? Um, but uh, but when there are recipes that kind of require something for which there is no substitute, right? That like you must use this. You know, she just comes out and says it, right? She doesn't mm -hmm. try and like give you a substitute that like you know, is going to be subpar. But at the same time, she also kind of talks at length about substitutions for things that are notoriously difficult to get. And, you know, like, instead of this, you could use this, um, right. you know, and also talks about how it changes it, right? So she'll say, you know, you can use, um, I don't know, so maybe a recipe might call for like galangal, which is like a type of ginger. You right. see it actually a lot in like Thai food. And you can actually get it now, at least in Philadelphia, I've started seeing it. But, um, but, you know, she'll say you can use like ginger instead of gal and gal, but this is how it will change like the flavor profile. And you may need to like, uh, you know, overcompensate with, you know, this, you know, more of this. So hers, I find are very, very well written, but she's, you know, she writes, I think it's also in part because she, she writes as an outsider about right. a cuisine that she knows very, very well. Right. She lived in China for a long time. Right. And obviously spent her life sort of studying these cuisines, but I think because she writes from the perspective of an outsider who's lived, um, you know, she's British, right? So she's lived in England. Um, she writes with the perspective of someone that knows that, you know, for a home cook that doesn't live in China, some of these right. things 
um, are going to be, you know, either hard to find or just totally foreign, right? So yeah, those hers, I find, I don't have that problem so much with, but I definitely have um, other cookbooks where it is like a little more challenging and you kind of have to figure out, well, if I don't have this, can I substitute that? But, um, but I find that to be kind of, uh, I find that to be a pretty enjoyable part of cooking. I think that's why I'm not always like a follow the recipe to a T. I like to find like things I can substitute and, you know, how will it change or do I actually like it better if I use this instead? Um, so, so do you have, um, do you have books that you just have, uh, by your nightstand? Because I know I do, right. That you just look through, but you've never made recipes from, and it's just really pure beauty of mm -hmm. the, uh, the book itself. Oh, definitely. I have so many of them. I have, first of all, I have cookbooks all over my house. Zach says there's, <laughs> there's too many, but you know, I mean, I, this is why I was so excited for this episode because it's like, the convergence of two things that I love food and books. Right. <laughs> but um, no, there's cookbooks in my kitchen, cookbooks in the living room, cookbooks on the coffee table, cookbooks upstairs. Uh, yeah, no, I have a lot of those. I think though, that um, the one that I really love the most, I, I acquired pretty recently. It was actually given to me as a Christmas gift or birthday gift last year. And um, I had been trying to find a copy of the book and just without success. Uh, and uh, so somebody gave it to me as a gift and it's called Milkier Pigs and Violet Gold. And it's, it is the most beautiful cookbook I have ever seen. The cover artwork is gorgeous. And what it is, is probably the most extensive cookbook of Filipino cuisine I have ever seen anywhere. It's, I mean, it's big. It's like a fat, like almost like encyclopedic. And it's written by a guy named Brian Ko, who's actually Singaporean. Uh, this version, Milkier Pigs and Violet Gold, is the second edition of his first version of it, which was just called Milk Pigs and Violet Gold. Um, and so he's added kind of like revisions and all of this to it. And I don't think the first one is in print anymore. But this one, it's just such a it's so unique, the book itself. And it's such a great like celebration, too, of of you know, the huge diversity of Filipino food and the Philippines in general, right? So the book is broken down by region of the Philippines, right? So right. The, the Philippines is over like 7,000 islands. And I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, there's so many distinct regions within that. It's entirely possible that a Filipino from some island in the north could meet a Filipino from some island in the south and they would speak their native dialects to each other and not be able to understand each other at all. Wow. And, you know, so it's so, so there's so many diverse like ethnicities too in the Philippines. So the cuisine really varies like all around the country. And uh, it's just such a, like it's, it's, there's so much care taken too. in the first, there's a whole chapter that just kind of goes into like the base ingredients of Filipino food, right? The different kinds of vinegar that they use, the different kinds of soy sauce and how it's different from, you know, Japanese soy sauce or Chinese right. soy sauce, um, you know, like really base, like, uh, like flavors, right? Like gar the, the use of garlic, the use of ginger. Um, and uh, the title actually, so milk pigs, uh, refers to lechon, which is, it, it's Spanish, right? And in, in, in Spain, they eat lechon and it's a roasted suckling pig. Mm -hmm. And in the Philippines, it kind of generally means uh, roasted pig. A roasted suckling pig is lechon de leche. Um, but, uh, but yeah, lechon is like one of the national foods of the Philippines. It's one of these things that you see at any kind of big celebration, right? You have the whole pig there. It's right. been like spit roasted. Um, and Filipinos eat it traditionally with like a liver sauce. Um, and then violet gold refers to ube, which I, I think we've talked about before, but mm -hmm. maybe not on the podcast. But um, ube is like a purple yam that's uh, indigenous to Southeast Asia. And Filipinos use it in all kinds of desserts and and uh, and different formats. Right. So it's the, there, there are these two things that are so central to um to uh filipino food but the book is just so beautifully done i mean i love to like just like flip through it and you know each chapter he talks at length too about the specific region the history of that region because the other thing as well is that the philippines 
other than also having many ethnicities and many languages, also had many colonizers. And so right. Fili- Filipino food is like very heavily influenced too by Spanish food, by Americans, um, by the Chinese, right? And so it's just this very, very rich um, food culture there. And you would think that like, it's impossible to kind of document it, but this book really, really does it. It's it's really amazing. It's so such a beautiful book. I'm kind of intimidated almost to cook to ever actually cook from it because I think I would have to like take a photocopy of the recipe and then like because I'd be scared to like put any kind of blemish on it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, the good cookbooks have greasy covers and stains on them. You I know, know. <laughs> but th- this one is so pretty. I might have to get a second right. copy and then I can cook from the second copy. And the, the, the first copy is just the uh, display. Coffee table, right? Yeah, right. The coffee table <laughs> display one. Wow, that's fascinating. And you said, mm. who is the author? Is it somebody who is Filipino and who uh, voted for me- for people who live outside of the Philippines or who no, is he? So his name's Brian Ko and he's actually Singaporean, mm-hmm. which... Singapore is another place with a really like diverse and and rich uh, food culture. But um, he uh, so he's like a food writer um, and journalist. And, I, you know, he talks in the introduction about his kind of connection to Filipino food and his first um, his first memories of Filipino food were actually from his Filipino nannies growing up in Singapore oh. um, and, and the kind of like the meals that they would cook for him. And then he spent a lot of time traveling around Southeast Asia and specifically the Philippines and, and just became very interested in, you know, Filipino food and culture. And so, you know, did all this research for this book. Um, uh, yeah. And the book w- was like wildly popular when it first came out, because of course, you know, there's really not that many, Filipino cookbooks in general. I mean, you can right. search on like Amazon and maybe get like 20 results, right? Right. Um and you know, it's it's just that it's just not a very well documented cuisine, I don't think. Um and so, you know, when he published this, which is by and large the most extensive kind of it's almost like an encyclopedia this this book. Um it was just so popular, right? And then so that's why he did this kind of second edition. But yeah, no, he's he's a Singaporean. But he writes with like, the other thing that's kind of nice is you can sort of, he never like, uh, I don't know, he writes with like a real sort of reverence and like respect for like, uh, right. for the cuisine and like the ingredients. And and you can just tell there's so much research and so much attention paid um, to, you know, what he's writing about. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing. When I first got it, I was just like flipping through it. I would show my mom and be like, have you seen this before? Like, what is this? Like, this is, <laughs> this is crazy. What is this dish? Like, oh my gosh. But yeah, no, it's it's really a gorgeous book too. We'll post pictures. <laughs> <laughs> we also have books that we use that are more, I guess, cooking lessons almost, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So... One good one, I guess that would be my first pick, is, you know, when I came to the U.S. as a young married uh, wife and I had to start cooking, I really wanted to make food from home. Mm -hmm. But again, I was telling you about all the conversion and not knowing, like, is creme fraiche the same as sour cream, is the same Mm -hmm. as whipping cream and all those good things. So, of course, mastering the art of French cooking is such like a resource right for us French people living in America and uh, (laughs) there's no um you know there aren't any necessarily pictures you know Mm -hmm. it's it's pretty like it's it's more like a reference book but what I like about it is like it it tells you at the beginning not just the ingredients that you need but also the like utensils like tools cooking tools Mm -hmm. and pens and whatever at the beginning so when you do your mise en place you really can even grab like all your bowls and pens and spatulas and everything that you need at the beginning Mm -hmm. and she um I mean you can tell that obviously the recipes have been tested and she like uh explained how to do things like how to debone a um a chicken for instance or how to do Mm -hmm. like almost like butchery it's almost like really like cooking school you know right so I definitely like appreciate appreciate that. That's been really, really helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely. Yeah. When you um I just thought of this question while you were kind of uh 
while you were talking, when you like approach a cookbook or I Mm -hmm. guess when you're, when you're thinking about what to make, Mm -hmm. do you go to the cookbook first and then kind of peruse through and like, you know, let it sort of tell you or see, see if something kind of inspires you, or do you kind of have an idea in your head and then go to the cookbook that you think might have the, you know, the recipe you're looking for? Or how do you like yeah. using them to well, to um, I think, you know, now, especially in the past, I want to say past maybe seven years, there's been more and more like blogs and, you know, online recipes available but a lot of times they may be, they may like spark an idea of what to make for dinner. But sometimes you need to go back to the source of to somebody else that you trust to make mm-hmm. the actual dish. So for instance, I may see on like, I may see on the internet a recipe or a suggestion to make, I don't know, fila en croute for dinner, right? Or for mm-hmm. a special holiday. But then you're like, okay, yeah, if I was to make this and invest time into making this very special dish, I'll turn to this cookbook for that instead because I right. trust it more, right? Mm-hmm. So I feel like the visual of the internet and, you know, people posting recipes on Facebook and all of that or even Instagram, you know, I feel like it, it sparks idea. But a lot mm-hmm. of times I'll just go back to like kind of like resource books for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of like how I approach it. But yeah. then this, uh, this book, for instance, the uh, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat yeah. Right, that book that you recommended to me. Well, first mm-hmm. of all, it's beautiful because of all the illustrations, and mm-hmm. you know, it tells you how to have like what to put in your pantry and all of that good stuff. Well, I was just reading the chapters. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just reading the chapters, right? Because it's a little bit uh-huh. of a chapter book. There are recipes, but it's a little bit of a chapter book where it goes mm-hmm. through all the the different elements and how it affects, and then that sparked. I was just very interested in her kind of like recipes and then I started mm-hmm. making it from it. But at yeah. first I just thought I was going to read it as a chapter book, mm-hmm. not necessarily as a cooking uh, yeah. you know, instrument. But yeah, yeah, that's that's a great book. I love it because it reads like a chapter book because sometimes right. sometimes my cookbooks I'll I'll just I'll just read as if they are like, you know, as if they're a book, right? Mm-hmm. Um and uh you know, I'll, I'll read through the ingredients, read through the, you know, read through the whole like actual recipe and, and kind of get, go on through them and hope that at some point I'll be, I'll be kind of intrigued by something. But that one is so great, right? Because it's written, it's almost both, right? It's a cookbook, but also just a book about learning to cook, right? Or how to cook right. well. Um and yeah, understanding things. Better. Yeah, understanding mm-hmm. things better, right? Like right. you do things. There are books like the Barefoot in Paris cookbook. It just like gives you recipes, right? It doesn't mm-hmm. tell you why you're doing things a certain mm-hmm. way or why you salt something in advance or like mm-hmm. how like having, you know, putting this fresh herb into this dish mm-hmm. is going to do all of those things. But yeah, that's uh, salt, fat, acid, heat. Just kind of take you step by step on it's kind of like a deeper dive right on yeah. uh on cooking and why you do things or why certain recipes always call for certain things at a certain time right mm-hmm. yeah yeah i think that's um i i always prefer recipes that kind of explain why i, mm-hmm. I think i'm just like that in general right i like to know why something like, why am I doing this? Um, uh, but yeah, the things that tell you, why do you have to sear it at this temperature, right? Why do you want to render the fat? Right. Why do you want to, um, because I think it makes you, I mean, it's like what I was saying earlier, right? Then it, once you learn like why things are happening, then you can like break away from the recipe, right? Like you, right. you're, you're more confident because you know that, okay, really what needs to happen is this process. So I just need to make sure if I change something that this process, right, of like rendering fat or whatever it is, still is still happening um and you know hopefully then i'll get a result that's you know pretty close i forgot what i was gonna say (laughs) (laughs) i I lost my train of thought (laughs) well i'm gonna show i'm gonna show you the last book i wanted to talk about today so this book called tartine bread Mm -hmm. from Chad Robertson. So Mm -hmm. Tartine is a bakery in San Francisco. Have you been there when you visited your sister? Do you know? I have not, but you know, I just watched some food show that like where they were at um the I think they like did a spin-off called like the manufactory or something. Mm -hmm. Yep, they did. Mm -hmm. 
So I actually got this book during the quarantine where when we couldn't find yeast anywhere, right, um, to make bread. And of course, when the pandemic started, everybody wanted to bake because that's mm -hmm. the only thing that made us as human feel better was to make bread. So I uh, started making, you know, my own my own yeast and got this book and it taught me and it's a little bit of a uh, it, it really kind of like explained to you the method of making sourdough bread and um, it's just a really good book and really teaches you the method but also way to spin it and make it your own right so this is another book uh, that you can uh, read as a chapter book and I the first time I read it I read it you know before going to bed and and then you kind of like uh, use the methods and it's just very it's just excellent 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 book yeah oh I forgot to tell you about my uh, my reference books so I have um so the two books that I kind of reference are they're not they're not cookbooks at all but I find that they're really great references for kind of just like food knowledge right mm -hmm. and the first one this book is so excellent it's called the culinarian a kitchen desk reference and and it's uh, it's written by a woman who's actually like a lexicographer um she's not a chef what is right that? She's just a lexicographer <laughs> so I, I think they they there's two kinds the first kind is um somebody who writes dictionaries or like in oh wow um, okay. and, the, and the second kind is more broad it's like somebody who studies um, like words and language and semantics, right? So you could be both. Um, so she's actually a lexicographer, but she's like a really avid, um, you know, like food person. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it's almost like something between like a dictionary and an encyclopedia. It's not that big. Um, but it's it looks big to me from right here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like physically, it's like not really like, you know, that big. Uh, okay. And, um, and uh, it just like, you know, it lists things as a dictionary would, but it has like a little bit more explanation. It has like small little illustrations sometimes, right? So that's the mortar and pestle entry. Right. And um, and it's great because like the descriptions, right? They, they obviously, they tell you what it is. Sometimes they'll tell you where the word comes from. And sometimes they'll kind of tell you a little bit of the history. So, so I just love to like read through this and kind of like look at, you know, different uh different entries for different things right and because you, I always learn something new when I read about right uh, read in here and the other day I was just kind of perusing and I remembered remember when we were talking about French toast and pain perdu mm -hmm. well look right here pain perdu see French toast so oh wow I, so I feel like it it also explained a lot of like the French cooking terms that are being used in mm -hmm the culinary world now that's awesome yeah all kinds of things and then and you know like there's entries for like french knife or um you know like so right here there's french knife french stick french toast fricassee fried dough fried rice um it's all kinds of things but the entry for french toast says is a dish made of sliced bread dipped in egg and milk mixture lightly fried mm -hmm. or grilled and served with maple syrup and or confectioner sugar and sometimes preserves the dish dates back to 1882 the french call it pain perdu lost bread because the dish is a way of using slightly stale french bread i was like oh my goodness uh, see i wasn't lying exactly, to you that's exactly, exactly what i told you right <laughs> <laughs> But no, but I love this book, but it's also great if you, um, you know, there's never been like an ingredient, right? If I ever see like an ingredient that I don't recognize or like, I'm not really sure, or maybe sometimes I'm looking for a substitute. So I want to know like, w really like, what is that ingredient used for? I've never not found it in here ever. Wow. All kinds of things, even like, you know, um, a lot of like Mexican foods or Latin American foods will kind of have like different kinds of chilies. Right. And so, you know, my knowledge of chilies is not that expensive. And so right, right. sometimes I'll want to know like, well, can I substitute like a different chili that I have here? Right. And I'll look it up in here and it's always in here. It's a, uh, it's a great, and the best thing about this book, let me tell you, look at where I got it. TJ Maxx. It was, <gasps> was 9.99 at TJ Maxx. <laughs> That's awesome. I know. I love this little book. Such a good found. 
It's I know it's so great. I highly recommend always looking at like the book section in like TJ Maxx and Marshalls and Ross because it's almost always cookbooks. And every once in a while, you find like great ones at a very good price. That's where all of my Chrissy Teigen cookbooks have come from. I've never paid wow. for for cravings or more cravings. <laughs> wow, that's but, awesome. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, no, this is a good one. And then the other book that I reference a lot is really has is really not a cookbook at all. It's called Where Chefs Eat. And my sister actually gave it to me as a gift one year. Um, and that is quite a like fat uh, little edition. And mm-hmm. basically all it is, is this giant list, you know, where the publishers basically surveyed a whole bunch of chefs across the country and the world and asked them you know, where they eat when they go to different cities across the world. So there's like, you know, restaurants in Sydney, in Somalia, in Singapore, um, you know, in South Africa, you can find almost any city in there. And, you know, it will be like, you know, they'll list the restaurant and just like a small kind of blurb or review about it. They'll tell you like what kind of cuisine. It's almost like a restaurant listing in like a magazine or something, but then they'll tell you which chef recommended it. And like the chef will have written like, you know, one or two sentences, sentences. So, you know, there's like restaurants recommended by like Gordon Ramsay or Mario Batali or um, in, you know, all kinds of cities all over the world. And it's, it's so cool um it's just such a cool idea and but now I've actually started using it whenever I'm like going somewhere else I'll be like oh you know what I'm going to like you know this coming week I'm going to Montgomery Alabama right I don't know other than like I'm assuming there's probably some good barbecue to eat there I was like where should I eat and that was the first book I looked in I was like you would you believe it there's not many but there's there's like a handful of restaurants recommended in there by different chefs um in That's Montgomery, amazing. Alabama. I know it's it's such a cool book. I love it. So do you? Um, so I have a whole nother genre of like food books mm-hmm. that I read. But do you read like books about food that are not necessarily cookbooks? So maybe like like food histories or anything like that. I really have not. No, that's like a, if I don't, I like to like browse through the recipes and learn you know, while looking through cookbooks, but no, I've never like read anything like that. I think when I don't read, when I don't have recipe books or cookbooks, I will read like fiction or like Mm self-improvement type of business books. Yeah. yeah. Um, And a lot of times I will listen to them in my car, but yeah, no. Do you have books like that that you would recommend? I have so many. That's like the whole, I would say that I have a lot of books at home, but I would say that half of them are taken up by either cookbooks or food books. And then the food books are broken down into like food history books, food memoirs, um, and then like food essay kind of things. So like, I'm trying to think. So like food memoirs would be like, uh, Anthony Bourdain's like Kitchen Confidential. Oh right? yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. There's like a whole. Right. There's so many, um, you know, chefs that have written kind of memoirs or or their mm-hmm. autobiographies. Um, but I have a lot too of people who are maybe not necessarily chefs, but who write, um, who write about food and how kind of integral it is to their growing up, right? And um, so I have a, a couple of different ones there, and. Uh, and then like food biographies. Did you ever hear of the book Cod when it came out? Mm-mm. So it's by a guy called Mark Kurlansky. And he's probably written, he probably started this whole like genre with, with Cod. Um, but what Cod is, is, you know, he's like a, yeah, so, yeah, a fish. Um, so he's a, he's a historian, right? But he approaches the way he writes like histories um, is by approaching one single topic. Right. So, you know, when he a cod is about the history of cod, but he also interweaves in it while telling the history of cod and cod fishing um, in America and around the world kind of tells the story of the history that's happening at the same time. Um, And he's I mean, he's written many more. He wrote one about salt. I think the most recent one he wrote was about milk. And they're just really fascinating if you enjoy like history as well, because um, because there's such an interesting way to look at history, right? Through this one, just through this one lens of 
you know, this one commodity, right? Whether it's cod, salt, milk. Um, but I would definitely recommend his books too, because they're very, they're very accessible, right? I mean, right. a lot of people don't read history because it can be like very dense and that kind of thing. Right, but the way, right. the way that he writes and the topics he write about, he writes about, um, I think are, are really accessible and, you know, he never, it never, you never feel like very bogged down either by like huge amounts of details. It's kind of right or kind of conversationally written. It's not, they're not very dense. None of them are, are very long books usually, but they're just these very concise histories of a very specific thing um, that are just like fascinating. But, uh, but yeah. And then I have like a whole bunch of different books that are, they're really just like uh, compilations of like food writing. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with like the best American series, but they're, it's like an annual series uh, done by this one publishing house where there's like the best American sports writing of 2020, the best American travel writing of 2020, um, the best American short stories, best American essays. And in 2018, so two years ago, for the first time, they published the best American food writing. Um, wow. And the, the way these series work is that they they have like a guest editor that's kind of an expert in that area every year right. that they change up that compiles and chooses, you know, whatever's going to be in the book. So the 2018 one was um, edited by Ruth Reichel, who's a very famous uh, um, food writer. At, but the 2019 one was edited by someone, you know, it was edited by Samin Nosrat. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just like, they're just a compilation of all kinds of things. So some of them are essays, some of them are blog posts, um, some of them are like short stories, but all centered around food. And they're, they're really, they're just really great for like, um, I really like reading nonfiction. I don't know if you right. can tell, but um, they're really great for like, to like reading on like a commute or if you're traveling, because like, you're just reading like an essay length right. Um, sort of thing. Right. Um, but yeah. My number one um, recommendation, though, for you, if you don't often read like food writing or like food history right. is and I think it's really the book that really got me started into like looking for more things like it is a book called McElhenney's Gold. And this one is it's quite short and it's a really quick read. Um, it's written almost like the story is just so crazy that it's written as you'll read it and think that it's like fiction. Right. Um, like some of it is too insane to be true, but McElhenney, I don't know if the name sounds familiar, but the McElhenney family are the creators of Tabasco sauce. And so okay. it's the history of this family and how they started making this Tabasco sauce way back, like way back when like Teddy Roosevelt was president, they knew Teddy Roosevelt, um, yeah, make it and how they started making it in Louisiana all the way up to like the present day and who like runs it now. And it's just, it's just crazy. Like when you read it, I, I like, I bought it thinking like, oh, this sounds cool. And I really love to buy right. it. So um, I was like, oh, this sounds kind of interesting. It's not that long. It'll be a fun read. And then I read it and I was like, this story is crazy. It's like, it could be a movie. It's also just like one of these like strange dynasty families, right? Like a very right. old Southern family where like right. just the craziest thing. They did the craziest things and the craziest things happened to them. Like they had parties with like Teddy Roosevelt in these weird like salt caves that were below the swamp of where they like of their farm or whatever. It, it's crazy. Anyway, I highly recommend. I recommend that book to everybody I know <laughs> because I love it so much. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever heard of it. I know. It's Ten so years. good. Nat, it's what good. happened? <laughs> you know, I actually I actually think I have two copies of it. So You need to I, bring it over. Maybe I can give you one. Yeah. yeah. That's what I have to say about about food. I feel like I have so much to read. You've just opened a whole new world here. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. It's really amazing though, because I think that food writing as like a genre of writing has really like has really grown a lot. And I think the internet has something to do with that too. Um of course. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's there have always been, you know, well renowned food writers, right? Like MK Fisher and all that, but um, but I think it's just so much more accessible now to, right. to everyone that yeah, it's really kind of grown into its own its own thing, which 
you know, like I said before, it's my favorite things, food and books. <laughs> can do it all day long. <laughs> do you like, so I know you said that sometimes you kind of like get recipes online, right? Do mm -hmm. you ever, com do you ever compile those too and kind of make your own like recipe book? Like, do you have a book that's just your recipes or, you know, um, ones that you've kind of gathered? Well, actually, I do have, normally I used to, it's, this is not really a good um, thing to do. I used to just print them and then like discard of them, you know, and I wouldn't keep them. But now I have this like, um, you know, this like cooking book display in my kitchen and I mm -hmm. just like keep piling them on, on this one like little display stand. And then for special occasions, like end of the year, um, you know, end of the year celebration or Thanksgiving, I have usually like folders where I like print all of the recipes, uh, you know, with a production sheet and timelines and things like that for uh, very larger like events and stuff like that. So then they have their own folders, but yeah, I do print them. Sometimes I save them. Sometimes I save them on my phone. Um, so I have, I can have quick access, but it's not, a, a, then that's just a recipe for disaster. You know, I'll forget mm -hmm. half of the ingredients or, you yeah. know. Yeah. I recently, so I kind of previously did the same thing as you, right? I had like mm -hmm. a, I had like a notebook where I would, sometimes I would like stick them in or sometimes I would transcribe it like from the mm -hmm. phone, just write it down if it was like short. Um, and then after a while I kind of would just like throw the uh, printed recipes in there and like in there no in no certain order right. so sometimes I'd be looking for a recipe and be like I don't even know if this was from a book or from like my book and I have no right idea. like the recipe for this cookie is next to the recipe for this stew like there was no right. order and so I decided it was time for me to get my recipes in order so I <laughs> <laughs> because I do actually have a lot of recipes from the internet that I right. use pretty frequently and I find that they're often for like things that a, a lot of times they're for like things that I ate as a kid where I've like searched online for like, you know, right. I really, I really want to eat this. Like, let me go find out how to make it. Right. And so the, the first time I've used it is or made it is from a recipe off the internet. Right. Because I don't right. necessarily know what cookbook would have it. And uh, so what I did is I went on. So on Amazon, you can buy these like recipe binders. And there, mm -hmm. I, I went onto a whole rabbit hole of the internet looking at these. There's so many different sizes and designs because, you know, some people write on like those recipe note cards. Yeah, I don't like that. They're, I feel our far too, too small. small. Yeah, I think both of our handwriting is too big. Yeah. Um, but also I feel like there's no room for notes, right? Because no. that's the other thing I do is like if I make a recipe often, and then like, you know, like to substitute something in or maybe always add something. Right. And I always like write a note on the side of it that like, oh, you should add avocados to this because like you right. did it one time and it was good. Right. Um, and uh, so I got like a big one for like an eight by uh, eight by 11. Mm -hmm. And it comes with like all of these like dividers and these little stickers that you can separate. You would love it. You would so organized. Fish. Um, and then I got a bunch of like a. Uh, what are those like slip sheet covers? The right, right, right. In the binder. I put all my recipes in there. But actually, I discovered I have too many recipes. So I probably have to get another binder because <laughs> it's too full. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I think it's time for our last bite. I think it is time for our last bite. What do you think? Yeah. So, Anya, what is, what do you, what is your last bite? Any well, last? I'm bite? gonna. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this week, you made me discover, so I was subscribed to the New York Times cooking mm -hmm. um, newsletter. And every week I was receiving, you know, like what to make this week or what to cook this weekend. And I love the pictures. I thought it was, mm -hmm. they were like so beautiful. And you told me about the app, right? I had I had downloaded the app before, but I didn't know if I wanted to subscribe because it's mm -hmm. like five bucks a month or something mm -hmm. or 40 bucks a year and I did not know if I wanted to subscribe and but you mentioned to me that it was completely worth it mm -hmm. and that um yeah when you go through maybe you can explain it better but when you um when you're cooking the uh and you said start cooking to a recipe the recipe doesn't fade out mm -hmm. right it doesn't time out mm -hmm. so like if you have the ingredient list or the step list it won't like your phone won't like go on I don't know what it's called 
anyhow am i explaining that good <laughs> yeah yeah the it it um it prevents like your phone from locking and like the screen going dark right obviously helpful when you're cooking because there's been so many times where like my hands are like greasy or like covered in batter or something and then right. you're like, oh no it froze i have to unfreeze it <laughs> so i made this um i made the apple crisp from that and i have uh, i saved the recipe because i still have all those apples from the orchards i have this recipe saved uh for pork and apples i'm gonna make pork chops and apples i'm mm. gonna make this week and it's so great it's so great i'm so excited yeah it's it's so good i i only recently um uh downloaded the, downloaded the app and subscribed probably only a couple of weeks ago but i've used it so much since then i think, mm-hmm. like, i actually think that that's probably what i've cooked from the most the most recently is just the new york times um app but i i've always really liked the new york times recipes i think that their recipes are really, really good about um, the way they like explain steps, the way they talk about, you know, substitutions for ingredients, right? Right. A little bit like what we were talking about earlier, where they'll tell you if like, if you, if you don't have this ingredient, it's going to really be different, right? Or like right. this ingredient, it's okay. You can substitute it for this if that's all you have. Yeah. I, I found that their recipes are always, they always work, right? It's just like your right. uh, Ina Garten, right? They just always work. If you follow the steps, they always work. But yeah, you, know, you just have to remember to read the instructions. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, my last bite today is uh, this little gem of a cookbook that I just purchased from uh, a used bookstore, a used books and records store near my house um, in the Italian market, and. It is possibly the best $10 I have ever spent in my life. It's called <laughs> The Art of Chinese Cooking by the Benedictine Sisters of Peking. So the Benedictine Sisters of Peking were these like American nuns who went to China as missionaries in like the 1930s. But then World War II came. And so they got displaced and somehow ended up in Tokyo. And they started teaching. They, they opened this little school where they taught uh, traditional Chinese cooking to people in Tokyo. And then this cookbook is apparently the result of it. I should, this cookbook was published in, I think it's 1956. So oh my gosh. Yeah. And it's this adorable, it's like five by seven. It's this tiny little thing with like a little so vintage. Pl- I know this little plastic ring binder on it, but the illustrations in it are just amazing. I mean, Today they would be considered very culturally inappropriate, but you know, as a <laughs> as a as a historical document, I think that they are amazing. They have all of these like li- there's like little bulbs of garlic that are like chasing the little piggy for this sautéed sliced pork recipe. There's um, you're gonna have fa- to post some photos of this. Oh, for sure. My favorite one is this recipe for braised duck. And I don't know if you can see Anya's, but this duck <laughs> is yes, literally can. smoking an opium pipe. An opium <laughs> pipe. That's, that's how old this cookbook is. But it's so great. I haven't actually cooked anything from it. But wh- after I bought it, I must have spent an hour just like reading through it and looking at these crazy little illustrations. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my last bite is this amazing little cookbook. Oh, sorry. I should I should say the best part about this cookbook is are, are the, like the little um, reviews on the front and back covers. So the New York Times calls it a small, excellent volume. But the best review is this. Air Force Times says... Finally, a cookbook has appeared that is the answer to a wife's dream and every husband's Epicurean prayer. Oh that, my goodness. <laughs> that should tell you exactly how old this cookbook is. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. And you know, there's probably only like 10 copies of this left in circulation in the whole world. So I'm good. This, this is the cookbook is definitely, I'll be treasuring it. <laughs> For a long time. It's a piece of history, <laughs> for sure. <Yeah. laughs> All right. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. We hope you enjoyed our show today. Don't forget that you can follow us on Instagram at Dinner Last Night Podcast. That's all one word, Dinner Last Night Podcast. We'd love to hear what you made for dinner last night and also what kind of cookbooks you have in your home. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.